Job chapter 15. We begin a second round of speeches uh, in this section of Job. Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad gave their first round of speeches, and now we have the second round of speeches with each one giving a speech and then Job responding sometimes to their speeches and sometimes he just laments, which is the biblical term for whining. Uh, in the third round of speeches, Eliphaz and Bildad have a speech, but Zophar does not. Apparently, Zophar is the youngest of the three, and apparently he said all he could say in his first two speeches. And then we've got uh, Elihu rounding up the speeches from the friends. So we've been teaching the class with uh, questions and answers. So uh, based on verses 2 and 3 of chapter 15, which is uh, Eliphaz's uh, speech, what or how does Eliphaz feel about Job's words? Vain Excuse me? Vain knowledge. Vain knowledge. Anybody have a different translation? Windy. Windy. Do what, Marvin? Empty knowledge. Empty knowledge. So the New American, Stan Empty. New American Standard says, Should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he argue with useless talk or with words which are not profitable? So what is Eliphaz saying about Job's speech? He's just blowing smoke, isn't he? Blowing hot air. <laughs> yes, the east winds, um, depending on where Job was living, typically refers to winds coming off of the desert. So it would be dry and barren and very unpleasant. Um, the Hebrew text actually says knowledge of wind... Uh, knowledge characterized by wind. So Eliphaz says, your words don't make any sense. They don't have any substance to it. And of course, that's just his accusation against Job because he thinks Job's a rank sinner and Job won't admit it and repent. And we've talked about that lots of times. Verse 11, same chapter. How does Eliphaz feel about his and his friend's words? Compared to Job's words, Job's words are all windy, useless, vain, he says. Well, what is his words? Are the comforts too small for you? All right, so are the consolations of God too small for you, even the words spoken gently with you? So what's he saying? He's saying, our words are words from God. And notice he says, these words are spoken gently. Would you agree with him? <laughs> I, I wouldn't agree with him. I don't think their words are gentle. When they say, you've got less than you deserve, I don't think that's gentle words. So the friends think highly of themselves, don't they? We ought to take notes as we work through this book on how not to encourage somebody. Gail? Well, we have a few examples of people reacting when they... Uh, are emotionally distraught, like King David. You know, King David didn't bathe and he didn't eat. Um, Joab was shocked that after the baby died, Bathsheba's baby died, David got up and took a bath and ate. And Joab said, why? That doesn't make sense. The baby's dead and now you're acting like everything's normal. And David said, well, when the baby was still alive, I was hoping God would revive him. But now that he's dead, I can look forward to going to see him. So I would say this is probably pretty typical behavior. They, they would do things to themselves physically, like sitting in sackcloth, wearing sackcloth, sitting in ashes, throwing dust in the air, you know, is, uh, beating their breast. You know, we've got several references to that in the Bible. So all of this is designed to increase pain, physical pain, 
to go along with the emotional pain that one feels. Now, we do that sometimes too, don't we? we get, what, what do you do when you get mad at yourself? Do you ever hit yourself when you get, when you get mad at yourself or aggravated? You at least you know, do that. What are you doing? You're, you're adding physical pain to the mental distress that you're experiencing. So we do it similarly, maybe just not to the same extent that they do. We don't know if Job is, if all of this is happening all at one time. What, yeah, the seven days happened very early back in chapter 3, but is all this happening in a 24-hour period? Is it happening over a seven-day period, 30-day period? We don't know. We don't know the length of time. Uh, in fact, Job has made more than one reference to not being able to sleep. So that suggests to me that there's at least a 24-hour period going on. But really, it's a question the text really doesn't answer. Uh, verse 14, does Eliphaz believe a man can be pure and righteous before God? No. That, the answer to that question is no, right? What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? He doesn't believe Job is pure and righteous, does he? Can a man be right in the eyes of God? Yes, because of the blood of Christ. You see, we on this side, well, on the other side of the cross too, they could do that. Yeah? Remember, Zacharias and Elizabeth, John the Baptizer's parents, are said to be righteous in the eyes of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 6, 7, somewhere around in there. So you could be righteous, but not on your own. Only by doing what God says to do. Mary, uh, Mary and Joseph, that's right. Remember, too, that the Apostle Paul said that under the law, he was blameless. Again, that doesn't mean perfect. When Paul sinned, he offered animal sacrifices just like the law of Moses required. But if you do what God says to do, then you can be righteous. All right. Verse 16, does, what does Eliphaz imply about Job in verse 16 of his speech? <laughs> I like friends like this, who needs enemies? Verse 16, well, verse 15, behold, he puts, that is speaking of God, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is detestable and corrupt, man who drinks iniquity like water. Now, of course, the implication of that is Job is the one he's talking about. So I think we could read between the lines. Eliphaz is saying Job is detestable and he's corrupt and Job drinks iniquity like water. Just eaten up with wickedness. That's another way of saying that drinks iniquity like water. He's eaten up with sin. And again, Job is going to come back and say, if that's true, tell me what I've done. I can tell you the righteous things I've done. Now tell me what the bad things are that I've done. These friends just really are not very helpful, are they? <laughs> Sometimes do we say similar things to our friends, especially when they're hurting, and we don't taste the words before they come out of our mouth? Verses 20 and 21, what happens to the wicked, according to Bildad? All right. So the wicked man writhes in pain all his days, and numbered are the years stored up for the ruthless. Sounds of terror are in his ears, while at peace the destroyer comes upon him. The destroyer here would probably refer to God. So the biblical teaching is... If you sin, you're going to get punished, right? That's what Bildad is saying. The sinners get punished. But then suffering is interpreted as being punishment from God. Therefore, if you're suffering, it means you have sinned. That's the illogical deduction that the friends are 
taking. Again, it's called retribution theology. And once again, we have the apostles of, of Jesus with the same mentality in John chapter 9, verse 2, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind. That's the exact same mentality that Job's friends have. And incidentally, I think it's the same mentality Job has, but Job is the one who is suffering for, he believes, uh, improper reasons. And so Job's theology and Job's reality are in conflict. And that's why we hear him crying out all, over and over again. Clarence. Yes, nothing pure. <laughs> yeah, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So, were they right in the eyes of God? That's a good question. That's what Joe maybe should have asked them. Have you ever suffered? You ever had a flat tire? <laughs> Verses 22 through 35, the biggest section of Eliphaz's speech, what does he believe will happen to the ungodly? They'll go into darkness and never come back. What's that place called in Hebrew, going into darkness? What's that Hebrew word? Sheol. And we've, we've seen Sheol several times, right? in the book of Job. So, if you just read down through here, you see words like darkness, verse 22, and the sword, verse 23, is darkness and distress and anguish. Um, verse 26, he rushes headlong at, at him, that is, God rushes headlong at the wicked and with his massive shield. And so, the wicked are destined for punishment. Is that a biblical teaching? Yes. So, once again, <laughs> Just because Eliphaz says it doesn't mean it's wrong. Generally speaking, it's his application of biblical teaching that is improper. It's the other side of the coin that is not right. You know, just because you're suffering, it doesn't mean you sin. And once again, have I said this every single class? We know for sure that Job is suffering because he is righteous, right? Chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 8 and chapter 2, verse 3. God is the one that brought Job into the picture. Satan came to... Uh, I'm studying Luke chapter 22 right now, and you recall that Jesus tells Peter that Satan has requested you to sift you as wheat. And the you there is plural, so he's talking about all the apostles. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. In other words, Satan has asked permission to put you all to the test. And Jesus says, I have prayed for you... And the you there is singular, so he's speaking specifically to Peter. And he says, when you have turned, which implies Peter is going to sin. It implies Peter's going to sin. But Jesus says, when you have turned, then you need to strengthen your brothers. Well, when Satan comes before God in Job's case, in chapter 1, Satan wants to sift Job. Well, Satan wants to sift somebody, and God says, how about sifting Job? And Job's over there saying, please leave me out of this. So Job is being persecuted because he is righteous, not because he is a sinner. And the text is clear on that in chapters 1 and 2. Doesn't the Bible say that my servant Job, no, more, no, no one is more righteous than he? I think it says that, doesn't it? No one is more righteous than he? I don't recall that expression being used Something with Job. how righteous he is? You look it up and tell me. He does talk about him being righteous. Yes. Yes, that is true. All right. Uh, Job's speeches are in chapter 16 and 17. Uh, actually, singular speech. Chapter 16, verse 2. What's Job's designation for his friends? Miserable comforters. When we, in the text we studied last week, what does he call them? You remember? Worthless... Remember last week he called them worthless physicians, chapter 13 and verse 4. He called them a bunch of quacks. 
Well, here he says, you are all miserable comforters. I have heard many such things. Verse 2, sorry comforters are you all. Is there no limit to windy words? <laughs> so now he's accusing them of having windy words. Or what plagues you that you answer? I too could speak like you. If I were in your place, I could compose words against you and shake my head at you. There you go, Clarence. There's Job turning things back on them. And again, I think Job believes in their theology, this retribution theology. But reality is causing an issue with him. You were going to say something, Donna? Yeah, a bunch of sorry friends you are. Sorry comforters. Clarence? Yeah. You're, you, the, the wicked conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity, and their mind prepares deception. So, Job's friends are miserable comforters. When I had a class in preacher training school, preacher in his work, Wendell Winkler was my professor, and he had a lecture or two on counseling and on uh, doing funerals. And he gave us a list of things not to say to somebody who was suffering. I probably haven't always remembered that. But there are things to say and there are things not to say. And generally speaking, we tend to say too much, right? We tend to say too much. Just pray is the best thing. Put a arm around somebody's shoulder. Could Job give the same comfort to them? Verses 4 and 5. Yeah, I just read those words. I too could speak like you. If I were in your place, I could compose words against you and shake my head at you. I could strengthen you with my mouth and the solace of my lips could lessen your pain. It makes me, kind of makes me wonder if he's been a little sarcastic there. I could lessen your pain with words too. I could give you what you're giving me. I could give you what you're giving me. Yeah, give you, a, give you a dose of your own medicine. The Hebrew text literally has the word soul. If your souls were in place of my soul. We've got an expression kind of like that in the United States, don't we? Something about walking in somebody else's moccasins. You can help or hurt by your words you use. Yeah. Who was it that said sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me? He didn't know what he was talking about, did he? We had a whole class on encouragement. How to encourage others. All right, so uh, who does Job believe is his adversary? Verse 9. Say that again. God. His anger has torn me with hunt and hunted me down. He has gnashed at me with his teeth. My adversary glares at me. This word for adversary here is not exactly the word for Satan, which is the definition of Satan in Hebrew as well as in Greek, but it's very close. It's spelled similarly. Notice on the screen I've transliterated it with an M instead of an N, so it would sound like Satan. And he's saying it out loud, of course. He's lamenting to his friends. And, and so he is, he, he, he really is got chapters 1 and 2 inverted. Of course, Job, does, as far as we know, Job doesn't know about Satan appearing before God. But in Job's mind, it's God who is making accusations against Job, not Satan. It is God who is the Satan, the adversary, rather than Satan himself. You and I have the advantage of having the big picture, right? We know chapters 1 and 2. We know what happened at the very beginning. Job does not. And that's why Job does all this complaining against God. 
But once again, and I've, I've said this a couple of times during this study, if we, have, if we have pain in our heart, we need to tell God about it. We don't talk to Satan. We have, we have no indication that we need to talk to Satan at all. No, no evidence that we need to have a carry on a conversation with Satan in our mind or otherwise. But we can certainly talk to God. And so if we're hurting, if we're confused, if we have doubts, whatever it might be, give it to God. If you're mad at God, tell Him. Job does. Now, God won't appear to us like He did Job, but His Word here will give us some answers. Verse 15, what does it mean to thrust one horn into the dust? Now, this is more of an interpretation question. What's the, what's the word horn mean in the Old Testament, in Hebrew? Hebrew poetry. Strength. It was power. So when Job says that uh, my face is... What verse is that? Verse 15. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and thrust my horn in the dust... If horn refers to strength or power, then what, what does it convey for Job to say, I have thrust my horn into the dust? He's powerless. His power has been thrown into the dirt. What would happen with a, a bull if he was running along and, and one of his horns got stuck in the ground? It, he wouldn't go much further, would he? So this is another way, a poetical way of Job saying, I don't have any strength, I don't have any power. And that happens to us. I don't know if you've ever experienced it personally, but obviously there are times when so many bad things happen to us that we just feel powerless. Sometimes we might say something like, I just can't go on. I don't see how I can go on. That's how Job feels. State of mourning. All of, all of the negative emotions we experience, Job feels all of them, doesn't he? Helplessness, frustration. He's angry with God. He's lost all ten kids. And his source of income, all of his livestock. Paraphrase Job's words of hope from verse 19. Put in your own words, verse 19. Now sometimes when I say paraphrase, somebody will just read it out of the text. That's not what paraphrase means. God knows I'm righteous. Very good. God knows I am righteous. And that's where his evidence is, right? The evidence is in heaven. The evidence is with God. Uh, verse 19, Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. I've been getting ready for next week, even, in, in chapter 19, uh, is, a, is a strong affirmation of Job's desire to stand before God. We, we have hinted that. We've seen it back in chapter 7. Job wants to take God to court. Job wants to have God present what he's done wrong. Why is all this happening? So here he says, my witness is in heaven, my advocate. Christians have two advocates. Who are they? The Holy Spirit and Jesus. I've got the verses on the screen if you want to write them down. John 14, 16 and 26, 15, 26, 16, 7 all refer to the Holy Spirit being our advocate. Some translations have comforter. Other translations have helper. The noun comes from the verb to call beside. You get the idea of somebody calling someone over and putting their arm around their shoulders. That's the imagery that we have with that word, parakletos, to call beside. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, John uses the word for Jesus. If we have sinned, we know that we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So not only is Jesus our judge, John chapter 5, 
He is also our defense attorney. How can you go wrong? How can you go wrong when your defense attorney is the judge? That's for us on this side of the cross. Job is wanting that. The cry for Job is, I need Jesus Christ. He doesn't know it. That's why he doesn't use those words. But that's what he needs. He needs somebody to go between him and God. And so we've got Jesus who is the God-man who can represent us to the Father. Moving on into chapter 17, the second chapter of this speech by Job. How does Job feel about himself? Verse 6. Worthless. I'm somebody that men spit at. How disgusting is that? It's pretty bad. You know, under the law of Moses, if you did not accept the responsibility of being a redeemer for your family member, then the family member could spit in your face. It's pretty disgusting. So that's how Job feels about himself. He says, I'm a byword. In other words, a, 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 a word of no account, no significance. If I stub my toe and I say rats, that's a byword. And it has no value. It doesn't mean anything. There's no substance to it. There's no truth value to that. And Job says that's, that's what he is. That's how people treat him as if he's worthless, he's insignificant. People spit at him. As he laments his condition. According to Job, what is the end of the righteous? What is the destination of the righteous? Verse 9. He grows... Stronger and stronger. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Now, we have already seen Job say that it's pointless to be righteous, haven't we? We saw that last week. If the righteous are going to suffer, and the wicked are going to prosper, then there's no benefit in being righteous. But now Job says the righteous needs to hold to his way. He's going to say in... I believe it's chapter 31. He says, I'm going to hold to my integrity until I die. And here he says he'd just grow stronger and stronger. So, do you ever do this? Have arguments with yourself and take the opposite position? There are times when we were in Romania when the mission team, the three men, would get together and we were, we were debating, almost literally debating, a course of action. And the three of us would argue, not argue, but, you know, take a position, and we would change each other's minds. So the next time we got together, I would take Eric's position, Eric would take Darren's position, and Darren would take my position. And, and all that does is it reflects an unsettled state of mind. We don't know what we need to do. And, and we see that with Job. On one side, he's telling the truth. He's speaking the truth. He understands that it's best to be righteous. And on the other hand, he says it's pointless to be righteous. If you serve God, you're going to lose your kids. So Job is, is struggling, not just physically, but he's struggling spiritually. And mentally, yes, yeah, psychologically. <laughs> Verses 15 and 16. What does Job believe his hope will produce? Where now is my hope? And who regards my hope? Will it go down with me to Sheol? Shall we together go down into the dust? 
So Job says that his hope is going to go with him into Sheol. In other words, it's not going to be fulfilled in the physical life. It's not going to be realized. He is hopeless. And that's a bad state to be in. When we lived in Kentucky, we, Rachel and I went to visit a lady who had visited worship services several times. She lived in a little small... It was a little room, living room with a, a small kitchen, like a kitchenette and a bathroom. I think, she, I think her bed was in the living room. Attached onto a, like a garage, like a steel frame building. And we're sitting there visiting with her, and she said, sometimes I look around these walls and I feel like God doesn't know I exist. That's a sad state to be in. If anything, she needed to be in a church family. I've heard really good words from Barb Evans when I went to visit her uh, Monday and then today. Uh, she was complimenting the church here and the cards that she's gotten and things like that. We need somebody to care about us. We need to know God cares about us, but Christians are, are God with skin on us. So we can encourage others. So Job feels like he's hopeless, and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm headed to Sheol. And again, in, in the book of Job at least... The picture of Sheol is not a picture of punishment, but it is a picture of despair and darkness and where God is not. That's the picture of Sheol. And Job uses the word eight times in his book. Any thoughts or questions or comments on these three chapters? Just one. Dale? Yes. Doesn't God actually do that by giving us free will? That's, an, that's another one of those verses where it's true or false depending on how you look at it. And in fact, Bildad made that comment earlier. Uh, I think it was back in chapter... Well, my cross-reference is given chapter 5, verse 1. That might not be it, but uh, Eliphaz has made a, a statement like that. Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. Does God trust his people? When he sends us on a mission, he trusts us. Uh, uh, what chapter are you in? We're in chapter 15. No, we back, uh, Dale's question was from chapter 15, verse 15. Does he trust his angels when he gives them a mission to do? Yes, yes, he trusts his angels when he gives them a task to do. He trusts us. Didn't Jesus say, go on all the world and preach the gospel? What's he saying? I trust you to share my message. So does God trust us? Yes. Do we fail him? Yes. So God doesn't put ultimate trust in us because God knows we're going to fail. I mean, the, the psalmist says God made us his flesh and he knows that we're weak. Marvin? I'm finished. Uh -huh. Well, remember that the Sabians and the Chaldeans were the ones who, who destroyed his flock. And so, in a very literal way, in Job's mind, God has turned him over to these invading nations, ethnic groups, to, you know, destroy his livelihood. Here, however, I think he's speaking more in broad general terms that he feels like God has thrown him to the wolves, to use an American expression. Uh, 
Well, it's certainly true. God has allowed Satan to have his way with, with Job to a limit. To a limit. And going back to uh, the conversation that Jesus has with Peter about Satan wanted to sift him, all the apostles, meditate on that text and you realize that Jesus is still limiting Satan. Satan doesn't have free reign. Just don't kill him, Dan. Right. Just, don't kill him. Just whatever Satan does, he does it within the confines of the authority of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul could say, we're not tempted beyond what we can bear. Satan is hamstrung. He, God allows us to be tempted to the extent to allow us to exercise free choice. Because remember the two, and this is in the, the screen here, the, the two greatest commandments are what? Love, your neighbor as yourself. Love God supremely and serve your fellow man sacrificially. That's all free choice. So at the end of each class, I'm sharing the philosophical argument for the existence of suffering, why God allows suffering, adding an extra point each time, really to stretch them out over 13 weeks. Uh, but here we begin with the nature of God. That's why it's so important for us to have a grasp on how God defines himself. And Sunday morning is another uh, sermon in that series, God is Jealous. And there's not too many qualities that God gives himself as a name. But in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 5, God says, my name is jealous. So in the same way we could say God is by nature love, 1 John 4, 8, God is by nature holy, Isaiah 6 and verse 3, God is by nature jealous. And we'll talk about that Sunday morning. Relative to suffering, we have to remember God is all-powerful, God is all-good, God is all-knowing, and God is perfectly just. God cannot do anything that is outside of His nature. Evil exists. Some religions deny that there is evil in the world, but Christianity and biblical Judaism does not. It recognizes that there is evil in the world. However... The only true evil is sin, summarized in the two greatest commandments. What does God expect out of human beings? Love God supremely, serve your fellow man sacrificially. Everything else falls under one of those two commandments. It is not evil that there be evil. That's really the point in this whole argument that atheists have a problem with. It's not evil for God to allow evil because, 3C, every, uh, evil results in every case from the abuse of man exercising his freedom. Sin always results from man choosing to listen to Satan over God. One of the requests for sermons that I got last year, in fact, when I mentioned it uh, just a few Sunday nights ago, I got my tongue confused. Next year, I'm going to have a, ser a series of sermons on who is Jesus from the book of Hebrews. One sermon from each chapter, 12 chapters. The next year, I'm going to have a series of lessons on the Holy Spirit, which is another series that was requested. But next year will also be a series on Satan. Who is Satan? How does he work on us? And we'll study Job chapter 1 and 2 in that because I only got, what, 20 or 25 uh, people in the class on Wednesday night and we got 200 on Sunday morning, so there's 175 people that haven't heard this study. But there's four accounts in the Old Testament where Satan plays a direct role, obviously the Garden of Eden, when Joab encourages David to count the people, 2 Chronicles chapter 21, there's Satan having a direct role, and then also Zechariah chapter 3, where, where Satan accuses Zechariah of being too sinful to be saved. So those will be the four stories we look at from the Old Testament, and then we'll also look at a few from the New Testament. As, as we study, how does Satan work? Marty? I was just going to say, if it wasn't for evil being in the world, we wouldn't have choice. 
can't have choice without choices. You can't have choice without choices. Yeah, by definition. Yeah. All right, so uh, a good thing, a good being, does not always have to eliminate evil as far as it can if, as Marty points out, evil is directly related to our freedom and if there is ultimate good that comes from our freedom to choose. Is there ultimate good that comes from our freedom to choose? It's called heaven. That's the ultimate good. And we can't get to heaven without the freedom to choose. As Norman Geisler says, forced love is rape. God doesn't force us to love Him. He extends the invitation and He allows us to make the choice. It does say in the Bible we're going to have trials and tribulations. We will have trials and tribulations. 2 Timothy 3, 3 and verse 12. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Number five, there are limits to what an omnipotent being can do. He can only do, only act within his own nature. When God created the angels, he created them with the ability to choose. He creates human beings, and he creates them with the ability to choose. And then number six, which is the point that I've added tonight, a good omnipotent being does not have to eliminate evil completely in order to be good. If the purpose of freedom is to train us to be like Jesus. The purpose of this world is to conform us into the image of his son. That's Paul's words, Romans chapter 8, around verse 29. So everything that happens in this world, everything that happens in your life, as an individual person, everything that happens in your life can be used by God to make you more like his son. And that's why it's there. I think it's powerful. And if we have this in our minds, if we've got our teeth sank into it, then when bad things do happen, then we can look at it from the big picture. And we don't get distracted by the, the frustrations of everyday life. We surely need to have the big picture in view. Any other questions or comments? Next week we'll have to cover four chapters, but this is Bill Daz and Zophar's second responses to Job, second speeches and his responses. It's Jessica. Choice, even good and evil. It's what you choose to do with it, you know? When we study the work of Satan, that's exactly... You ought to count the number of times I use the word choice when I do that series of sermons. Because that's what Satan does. God says, do this. Satan says, do that. And we have to choose. God says, don't put your faith in the military. Satan says, David, you need to count your military. There you go. There's your choice. Satan listens to Satan, and God wipes out part of his military. Clarence. Yeah, the wrong premise on what was going on when we being punished for good or evil, or blessed by our good or evil. And we had no idea. And when you have a wrong concept, you're going to have this inner fighting amongst yourselves. But you also draw so many wrong conclusions. So some of the we need it ourselves are remind ourselves of we need to make sure that we're looking at God's word and looking at the truth and making sure that we understand what it's saying so that when evil does come along we recognize it. Exactly right. If we have if we start off with the wrong premises, <laughs> we're gonna wrong up wind up with the wrong conclusion. And so as Clarence has pointed out, if if our our minds and our hearts and our thinking are saturated with the Word of God, we're going to have the right premises and that's going to cause us to draw the right conclusions. So when a child gets killed and somebody says, God just plucked a rose for his garden, that person is operating from the wrong premise. And I think statements like that have created more atheists than theists. That completely ignores the existence of Satan. 
Any other thoughts or comments? All right. I'll have a quick prayer and be dismissed. Our God and Father in heaven, we are thankful for your love. We're thankful, Father, for this example of Job that gives us encouragement and hope. And we're thankful, Father, that Christ came to experience humanity for us so that we can know that he knows what it's like to be human. We're thankful, Father, that he lived a sinless life and he offered himself as our sacrifice. And we come to you through him. Keep us in your care and dismiss us, Father, and bring us back together again on the next Lord's Day. In our Lord's name we pray. Amen.